in this. So we're going to jump in tonight, and we're going to take uh, three sections of this. This is a 36-verse chapter, and it kind of is all in kind of bulks. Now, I'm going to do something since when we have a, a large section, I'm going to kind of do a little commentary along the way. All right, and then we're going to look at the first 14 verses, but we're going to start with the first 14 verses. Here we are. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I'm an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and tore down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So, two, at the, the present time, now what he's doing is he's putting a connection how Elijah thought he was it. Everybody else has bailed on God. He's the only person left. Have you ever felt that way in your family? Everybody's bailing on God. You're the only one wanting to serve God. It's probably a distortion because it was for Elijah also. God says, no, there were 7,000, but he uses this word and he does this little history lesson to connect to the future and Israel's future. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. How's the remnant chosen? By grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What the, what the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened, as it is written. God gave them the spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see and ears that could not hear to this very day. And David said, may their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Again, I ask, have you noticed that in this, the scriptures God is using questions along the way. It's a great teaching tool that he's using here through the Holy Spirit. Again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Hmm, that's going to be a great question here in a moment. Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? Okay, so Israel rejects and the world gets to learn about God. Somewhere in the future, there's going to be a full inclusion of Israel. Verse 13 and 14, I am talking to you Gentiles in as much as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my people to envy and save some of them. All right, here's what's taking place. Now, because of what we just all heard in this for years, there was a false theology. For how long? For about two millennium. We call this now under Israel's full inclusion. This is point number one. For 1,878 years, that's almost two millenniums, almost 2,000 years, it appeared Israel had no inclusion 
until 1984. So let me tell you what was taking place here. We're seeing chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11 of Romans as this. God is sovereign. Now, when he's sovereign, he's sovereign in his timetable also. You and I would choose a different timetable because we don't have 1,878 years for something to come up past in this. Israel's full inclusion. He gives us this whole story and he takes it down the path of first Elijah, then David. He's going through their patriarchs. Why? Because of the patriarchs, there is a remnant always in Israel that's trusting God. All right, that's what the scripture just told us. Now, what we're seeing within that is the length of time in this for full inclusion, the length of Israel's disappearance, they disappear in 70 AD, they reappear as a nation in 1948, is attached to something in Isaiah 61, verse seven. It's attached to the, God's grace and their land. In Isaiah 61, verse 7, he gives a prophecy about a double portion coming to Israel. But in Isaiah 61, 7, it says that this double portion will take away one thing, their shame, and it will give them a double portion while they are in their land. Now, they're going to receive a double portion of what? They're going to receive a double portion of grace. Now, you may not think it's a double portion of grace when you're dispersed for almost 2,000 years, but the reality is it, it goes to show that God never gives up on somebody, even if it looks like for decades something has been given up on. Existence. Romans chapter 11 says something's going to take place when Israel comes into full inclusion. How could they come into full inclusion when there isn't a Israel? Okay? So what the preachers and the teachers and the theologians had for 2,000 years almost, for that 1,878 years, they had a void of saying, how do I fill in that blank? There is no Israel. There was no sign of them coming back to be in Israel until after World War I, when the Balfour Declaration said the Jews could go home. And they started coming home to their homeland. Now, when Hitler started going after the Jews by around 1933, they started trying to scatter in Germany. As a matter of fact, many of them went to Austria. If you know where Germany is and you know where Austria is, it's like, we're going to go next door to the next country over and be safe there. But what, five years later, Hitler takes over Austria and he annexes it into Germany. So the Jews aren't safe there. If you go back and you read the history of it, it's amazing how many of the Jews started coming to a place called the United States. It almost is like what we're having today with the Muslims where they were all being scattered because they, they are being persecuted by ISIS and being killed and all that. That the United States was taking in those that were being persecuted, the Jews, and you read about how in our Senate and all the rest, they were debating how many of these refugees, Jews, should we be taking into our country? Seems like things don't really change much, does it? But because there was no Jewish nation until 1948, the teachers and the preachers and them did something what we call today is replacement theology. As a matter of fact, in that little note there, in Israel's full inclusion, you might want to write that word, replacement theology. Since they couldn't see an Israel on the horizon, they said, oh, all these passages, and they took Romans 9, 10, 11 said, it must be the church, not Israel, because there isn't an Israel. So obviously, it was an easy mistake to make that you would say all these scriptures actually apply to God's people, the church. And so they started saying, everything that used to apply to Israel applies to Christians. It's a bad theology. 
There is a path within God's word, and as we're going to look at it tonight, that he has for his church and he has for Israel, and they are different paths. We do not want to be on the same path as Israel. And thankfully, since 1948, we can see that this section, chapter 9, 10, 11, Israel's past, Israel's present, and their future. We're going to see how that God's grace, just like Isaiah said in 61, chapter 61, about the year of the Lord's favor, when it gets down to it, he says, I'm going to give a double portion to my people. I'm going to give a double portion to them, and they will receive it when they're in their land. Their double portion is still yet to come. They're in their land. They will celebrate May 14th, 2018, 70 years being back in the land. So, full inclusion comes when? It will not happen until the middle of the seven years of tribulation. Up to that time, they will still be in their sin. What's their major sin as a nation? They rejected God's one and only son. But somewhere in that dead middle of the tribulation, they will see the Antichrist for who he is. But greater than that, see, we always say that their eyes will be open to oh, the Antichrist is a false Messiah. But the good news is their eyes will be open to the true Messiah, Jesus. How cool. That's when full inclusion starts. And he gives this analogy of a tree and roots and branches. We're going to look at that as we go into this next section. It's so very, very important because you will see as this next section, verses 15 through 27, another big section, how when it ties all together, how we that now know Israel is Israel out there, and these verses apply to them, you'll see how there is a different path for the church as there is for Israel. Let's pick it up in verse 15. Again, I'm going to do some commentary along the way. Here we go, verse 15. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? <gasps> Now, I don't know how long God thought that they need to be dead as a nation for people to believe this is really God fulfilling Ezekiel, that dry bones can live again. To you and I, if someone's dead a week, we go, well, maybe they weren't really dead. If they're only in the grave three days, you know a lot of people said, Jesus just actually got a lot of strength back, rolled that stone aside and got out of there because he was only dead three days. This nation was dead for almost 2,000 years. It's an important part here. If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches had been broken off and you though a wild olive shoot had been grafted in among the others and now share the nourishing sap from the olive root. Root and branches. Does this remind you of any other passage in the Gospels? Like John chapter 15? Okay, it should. We'll, we'll tie it in. Do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Now, if you can't tell, this conversation is going back and forth to the Gentiles going, hey, we've been grafted in and actually we're, at any, and Paul's saying, wait a minute, the natural branches, Israel, were broken off. The root is who? God. 
Jesus. That's where we get life, all right? And he's saying, if he didn't, you know, let the natural branches stay because of their unbelief, don't be ag- arrogant in your, in your beliefs here. Be humble, very, very important. All right, so verse 21. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and the sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you. Provided that you continue in his kindness. Now, if you attend a church called the Ark Church for acts of random kindness, how often do you remember and enjoy the fact that God's been kind to you? It's kind of like a little footnote in here that that I thought was pretty cool. Otherwise, you also will be cut off if you don't remember, if you don't celebrate the kindness that God has given you. You could be cut off. Verse 23, and if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in. Who will be grafted in? The original natural branch will be grafted back in if they don't continue in their unbelief. You see how this is Israel's future, all right? You're you're following along with that so far. Verse 24, after all, if you were cut off, if, if you were cut out of the olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Hmm, that's really good, isn't it? Verse 25 through 27. This is, he's now going to give you a little aha here that there's other connections. When you see a certain word like mystery, secrets, keys, the Bible is filled with those words. I will give you the keys to the kingdom. I will show you the secret, but I won't show them. Here's a mystery. Well, here it is right here. Verse 25. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery. All right. We're going to look at the mystery here in a moment. Brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited, Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godliness away from Jacob. Why do you think he picked Jacob there? He's giving you a time period. I'll just give you that and tell you what the time period here is in a second. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. We're talking about the future of Israel in all this. And we're seeing that there's a mystery, a secret that's going to be revealed. And he says that he's going to take away things and he brings out Jacob. In the Old Testament, a time period in our future is called the the times of Jacob's troubles. The time of Jacob's trouble is the tribulation. So he's pointing at mysteries of things in the future. And he says, I want you to understand these mysteries. Here we're going to look at this. It all deals with kingdom root systems. The kingdom root systems. Now, this one I'm going to put up one at a time. But I'm going to take enough time that you should be able to get it all. All right. Let me get a drink here. We've been seeing what he's been laying down here. Number one, no superior branches. The church is not superior to Israel. For God so loved the world, right? So we see in this, the only hope is our rootedness in Jesus Christ. It's not that you're highly favored and someone else isn't. Your only hope. Your only source of life is if you're drawing it from the source of life. Who is the way, the truth, and the life? Jesus. He is the root. We are the branches. Do you remember as a kid doing that little song? (laughs) He used to have to, it was a motion song where, you know, he's the root and we are the branches. 
Okay, anyway, this is very important. This is connecting back to the gospel in John, as I alluded to earlier, John chapter 15, that Jesus says, if you remain in me and I'm in you, you will have life. But if you don't remain in me, you're dead. So there's no superiority. He puts this in here so much because we do this in the kingdom so much is that we think one, one section is more superior than the other. No, the only hope that we have is in Christ Jesus. Now, he says there's a mystery tied into this root system. So I'm going to take you down a little journey here to show you how the system is so rooted in God and how it actually shows different elements, all right? Number two, the ability to see this world by rightly dividing the word of truth. (gasps) Okay. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, you can see the truth when you rightly divide it. Chuck Missler does a great thing on this. He does a whole thing. When you go to Genesis chapter 1, if you ever go to his teaching, he actually takes about eight weeks on Genesis chapter 1. It's amazing what he teaches on it. But one of the things that he, what he does in this, and it's stuck in my mind in this, he said when they started to be able to look at the stars, they had inferior telescopes. As the telescopes got better, they could see clearer. And many times when they were looking at something they thought was one star, it was actually two stars very close together. We know that's true when it comes to the Bethlehem star, that it's actually two planets very close together. Jupiter and Venus come so close together, and every 2,000 years so far is what has been 2 BC, and then again in June uh, 2015, 2,000 plus years later, Those two plants came so close that it looks like one star up there. But if you can see clearly the word, the truth, you can be able to divide and see that instead of one thing being there, there's two. That's kind of the key to this mystery. Instead of one thing, there's two. Instead of it's Israel or the church, there's just two, all part of God's kingdom. All right. Now, watch how this plays out. There are two kingdoms within God's kingdom, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. One is rooted in the other. All right. Now, this may be new for some of you. There was a long time that I used to always say, Matthew is, by the way, Matthew is the only author in the Bible in the New Testament that calls the the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, but he also uses the term the kingdom of God. In his book of Matthew, he uses the term the kingdom of God five times, but he uses the term the kingdom of heaven 33 times. Hmm, wait a minute. Who lived to be 33? And actually, what he's doing, he's quoting Jesus most of the time. And that's why I put the scripture up there, Matthew 13, uh, 24 through 30. That's the start of many parable, parables that Jesus has given. And Jesus uses the words, as it is in the kingdom of heaven. Now, watch this again. If we're rightly dividing, the kingdom of heaven is rooted in the kingdom of God, but they're not the same. They're not the same. In the kingdom of God, there is no humans that are alive. There are humans that have died. There's the angels and there's God. There's no evil, no sin in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of heaven, when you go and you look at all the teachings that Jesus gives of the kingdom of heaven, use Matthew 13 as your first one. The parable says, in the kingdom of heaven, there's the wheat and the tares. They're still together. In the kingdom of heaven, the good and the bad are still together. Here's what, here's what you need to learn. When something is rooted in something else, the kingdom of heaven is rooted in the kingdom of God. But Jesus is teaching about his kingdom, earthly kingdom, that he's going to be setting up. This is what he's teaching in, through Matthew's book. The kingdom of heaven has something different 
than the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, where God is, he's the king and he's everywhere. So the kingdom of God's everywhere. The kingdom of heaven has locality. As a matter of fact, the capital of the kingdom of heaven, we know one day will be Jerusalem. Now, remember the kingdom of heaven is within the kingdom of God, but it's not totally the kingdom of God. You will see as you look through all the different parables that describe it, that there are good people and bad people. There are the sheep and the goats in the kingdom of heaven. There's the wheat and the tares. There will be a separation. He's talking about establishing his kingdom here on earth And he's pointing to a future time called the millennium, where the actual kingdom of heaven will be Jerusalem. The kingdom of God is always where God is. He's the king. All right? So, are you following me so far? If, again, you're allowed to ask questions, I do have a phone here on this. We will get to that. Point number four here. Watch how this now, again, rightly dividing... The body, <laughs> this, is, this is interesting, the body of Christ and the bride of Christ are not the same thing. One is rooted within the other. The body of Christ and the bride of Christ. I learned this in a very kind of mystical way. When you connect all the dots, when you connect Genesis with the rest of the Bible, watch this. Now, the the scripture I give you there is the parable that Jesus gives about the kingdom of heaven again. Like the kingdom of heaven, there are ten virgins. All are virgins, but only five will become the bride. Okay? So the, the bride of Christ is rooted in the body of Christ, but it comes out of the body. Just as Adam had a body... And his bride came out of his body. (gasps) A typecast, yes, shadow of a future. Out of the body of humanity came the bride. Are you catching the, the visual of this? All right. So when Jesus gives this parable, all of them say, we're Christians, we're virgins. And he says, only five of you have oil for the bridegroom to come and to be able to go many now you have to decide on this and probably the way i'm teaching it here tonight you'll probably decide to believe like i'm doing and that might be an an injustice to you because you should you should grapple with this for some years you may be hearing this for the very first time um Because he says they were all virgins, they all believed a certain thing, they all had a certain amount of oil, but only a group were wise enough to be looking for the bridegroom. Do you remember me teaching at the end of the Olympics that there are the five crowns and one of the crowns alludes to those that are looking for his coming, they get a reward? Is it possible the virgins all thought they were ready for God? But only five were looking for him. Five were, had light on the season that he was coming. Only five, only half of them made in that. What I'm telling you in this is that the body of Christ is not as a secure place as the, being the bride of Christ is. The bride says, I'm in an intimate relationship with the bridegroom. I am married to him. He's my husband. He's my Lord. He rules over me. I just haven't added him to a portion of my life. He is the center of my life. He is the one that dictates what's right in the will for my life. He has top say in everything in my life. He is the man because he's my God. That's different than just saying, I go to church, I know God, I love him, you know. But if you, you you'll see this in, in, on, on Easter Sunday, I'm going to draw you a circle. In the circle is your life, and 
put all your names by your initials around it and put J for Jesus, who's at the center? Sometimes I am, sometimes Mindy, sometimes one of the kids is in the center. And hey, even once a week, I let Jesus be in the center. That is not a center-led life around Christ. It's when Jesus is the center and all of our lives evolve around decisions based on him. That's a spirit-filled, Christian-led life. That's the bride of Christ. You can't get there until you realize that so often the wheat looks like the tear. That's why you can't take it out. It's the job of the angels. Some have a hard time knowing who's a sheep and who's a goat. They both go, bah, sounds the same. But they're different, aren't they? He uses his parable that rooted within the kingdom of God is the kingdom of heaven. His rule that will be a rule here for a thousand years. Within the body of Christ, there is the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ is the safe part of the body. The rest of it could fall very simply on being a religious institution that Jesus never came to set up. When he, when he uses the word, this is my body, he's talking about his bride, just like a husband and a wife are one. He's talking in that way. Too often we say we're part of a family of God. So Jesus says, I'll give you this parable. 10 virgins, they all have some oil, but only five are wise. The other five are very foolish when it comes to the kingdom of heaven. Because that's what the parable is about. All right. Now you're seeing those things. So how does this relate to Israel? Israel was grafted in. They're broken off. To see it clearly, God was never done with them, even though it was 2,000 years before they come back to life in 1948. Israel hope starts with the bride. Isn't that interesting? Number one. Israel hope starts with the fullness of the Gentiles is the key for Israel. Someone has to demonstrate what it is to be in a right relationship. The fullness of the Gentile is speaking about a time of the church. That's the church. The fullness of the Gentiles is the church. Now, I know all of them are up there. They're going to be up there long enough for you all to get down. But catch this. The bride of Christ is a key for Israel to realize there's something true of this Messiah. Why? The bridegroom's coming to take the bride. All those Jews that though they had the law, they had David, they had Jacob, they had Moses, they had all the patriarchs, what it talks about, they miss the bridegroom coming because they didn't recognize him as the Messiah. This is part of the eye-opening experience for them. What I'm telling you in this is the rapture is a key part for Israel's salvation. They don't know what to do with all these people missing and some claiming that it was God taking them. All right. As they read the word, they will see it. The number two here, the time of Jacob's trouble begins at the tribulation. It actually begins, here's some of the things, let me, let me share with this. To real eschatology people, the tribulation really is only the last three and a half years. The first three and a half years, people will be buying, selling, and trading, and getting to know this new world leader called the Antichrist. It will not be as scary and as bad from what's happening from the Antichrist is not bringing bad things on the world at this point. What's coming on the world is the wrath of God. And many of them will see it as, oh yeah, man, terrible bad plagues are happening. But we've always had plagues throughout history. Oh, terrible bad things are happening to the economy. Terrible bad things are happening. Wars and things are breaking out. And they're going to see all the things that coming from God's hand this time as this is just nature on steroids and things are happening. And the Antichrist will assure them he will guide them to better days. It's at the last part, what Daniel speaks of, 
this time of Jacob's troubles, the last three and a half years, this is where the Jewish eyes are open. They connect the dots. There was a bride. The church that was here is missing. Jesus is the Messiah. They will then come into what Romans chapter 11 is saying, full inclusion. Full inclusion is going to take place. God is setting up for what? He's going to set up so that they can be saved also. And the kingdom of heaven will reign for a thousand years. Where? From its capital, Jerusalem. Number three and four. This is where they're grafted in once again. They were a part. They were the natural branches. Now they're being grafted in. They will say the kingdom of heaven established where? In Jerusalem. That's why I had to take you down that whole path of history there. So you could say when I'd say they will see the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God comes into play at the very end of what our passage is here. Let's deal with the last few verses here. Verses 28 through 36. All right. Hope we is it is it as clear as mud to you out there so far? You're tracking. Okay. Verse 28 through the end here. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as the election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriots, patriarchs. What they're talking about is Israel's not on our side of the equation right now. They're against Jesus. So they're an enemy in that way. But because of their history, because of the faithfulness of the past, they are, they are loved just like God so loved the whole world. Okay. Verse 29, for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Powerful verse right there. Just as you were at one time disobedient to God and have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. That sounds really tricky. It's really simple. Again, our lives become a testimony to the Jews in the future. Gentiles being saved because of his mercy. Gentiles being raptured because of his plan for his bride. These things, this is what I was trying to tell you, are going to speak to Israel. And they, the light bulb's going on because of those things. For verse 32, for God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Here's the doxology of all this. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Whew, what a great sentence right there. Watch this, though. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. What I've given you as some of the tracing of his past is just the beginning. I think in all eternity, we get to see how these pasts were really traced out better than what we could see with our own eyes and understanding with our own mind. All right. Then verse 34, who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. What he does there, he says at the end, some people are going to say, this doesn't seem fair that he allowed Israel to be blind so that the Gentiles could be saved, so that the Jews would envy them. They would see the things that God is doing with the Gentiles, the rapture of them, the mercy in them, that they would all be drawn back to God. God, that's not fair. And he's going, wait wait a minute. When do you start counseling me? When when did I ask counsel from any human? Okay, that's kind of how he ends in this. But he talks about his judgment here. And so it ends with God's judgment. And and in that, we're going to do just the things that you should already know. Very simple in closing. The Bema Seat judgment is the judgment of our works and faith. The bride of Christ is judged. That happens at the rapture. Okay, when the rapture happens, all those that were caught up with Christ will be judged there, not for heaven or hell, but for rewards or 
no rewards. If you're caught up, your main reward is you're in heaven. But there are other rewards that we've talked about. Now, later, after the thousand years of the kingdom of heaven reigning on earth, the way we were supposed to live without Satan's messing up paradise. The kingdom of heaven reigning with Jesus on the throne of David in Jerusalem. At the end of that, the devil's released. He deceives some. There's a battle. We don't know how long. The Bible doesn't give us clarity. But then we are ushered into this time period called the great white throne judgment. Is the judgment of of our acceptance or rejection of God and his son at that time. So it takes in the seven year period of the tribulation and the thousand years and those that accepted or rejected God and his son are judged at that time along with all the rest of the dead. Now, who would reject God? We know about the rejection of the son. So here's the final question. Who rejected God the father? It's really easy. The great white throne judgment is also the judgment for the devil and his fallen angels besides the dead humanity. <clears throat> well, father, I didn't think I could get all this in before eight o'clock. I don't know if they're confused, if they know what's going on, but your word is amazing. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you have a plan for Israel and it's still in the future and that there is hope for them and that we are the testimony to them that will help them as they open up their eyes. And that's true for many living Jews right now. They come to know you because of our testimony of your son in our lives. Thank you for that truth. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.